Can you tell me why you joined? Um, just having issues at school. I went to school for one year, and it wasn't something that excited me at the time. And so I just wanted to do something a little different. And the military provided um, that adventure that I was looking for, so they claimed. And then um, a way to, to pay for school once I got done with my, my enlistment. So and that, was, that was appealing. Why did you pick the Marine Corps? Um, well, the military was never part of my original plan. And so it was kind of um, a crazy... Uh, turn that I was taking, so I figured if I'm going to go crazy, I might as well go all out and go with the toughest. Do you recall your first days in service? Oh, as far as uh, boot camp? or yes. Right after you enlisted, um, where did you have to go for induction? Um, uh, well, my boot camp was at Paris Island. and Is that the first place you went to? You went straight to Paris Island from home? Yeah. What was the year? It was uh, January of 2002. And how long was boot camp? Um, three months. Can you tell me what that was like? What did you do there? Uh, it was, I mean, it was a tough three months. It was, <laughs> but, you know, looking back on it in retrospect, it was, it was actually a lot of fun. But um, at the time, you know, it, it was miserable. <laughs> but, but um, I mean, it was just a lot of drill, um, a lot of physical training, um, a lot of classroom instruction, believe it or not, um, what, the, what the Marine Corps called knowledge. So you'd be learning your knowledge and, uh, and a lot of getting yelled at. So a lot of running around, constantly on the move. What kinds of things would they include as knowledge that you'd learn in the classroom? Um, just basic Marine Corps history, um, military history, um, you know, important battles, historical battles that Marines participated in, um, and then you know, tactical type stuff, um, how to how to dress wounds and um, first aid, things like that. And then, do you recall any of your instructors at Ferris Island? Oh, yeah. yeah. I remember them. Can you tell me anything about any of them? Um, they were some of the toughest characters I, I ever came across in my, in my life to this point. Um, my senior drill instructor, his name was Staff Sergeant Rodriguez. And then the... Uh, the other one was drill instructor Staff Sergeant Aspiazu, and then the heavy hat was drill instructor Sergeant Edwards. And all three of those were, were extremely tough individuals. Do you have any memorable experiences from boot camp? Memorable? <laughs> it's all memorable. I mean, it's hard to really forget it all. Um, I mean, other than that, it, it was just, I remember we had to speak in a third person the entire time. Um, you couldn't refer to yourself as I, you were this recruit and things like that. So, you know, it, initially it was, it took some time and adjusting, getting used to that, that type of a routine. And if you broke, you know, you went out of that, um, they really lit you up for it. So you learned pretty quickly to, uh, to speak in third person and you to maintain still that. Do speak like that in the Marine Corps? Or is that just for boot camp? Well, that's just for boot camp. I think that's too, it was one of the ways that they tried to instill discipline in you. So. And then was there a graduation from boot camp? Yep. They were graduated in April, I think towards the end of April. After your graduation, where did you go? Um, I actually had orders to go home and do recruiter's assistance for 30 days. So I had my 10 days of boot camp leave, which every, every graduate receives. And then on top of that, I had 30 days where I was assigned to my recruiter and I had to help assist with recruiting at in the, Connecticut. in Connecticut, out of the New Haven, um, recruiting station. 
And that's only for 30 days? That was for 30 days. And what and happened after the 30 days? After that, then I had orders to go to MCT down in um, North Carolina. What's camp MCT? Uh, Marine Combat Training. And that was at Camp Geiger. And when I got there, I, uh, I didn't get placed right away with a class. So I, I can't remember exactly. I guess it was just guard duty. Um, so I was, uh, participated in, in guarding parts of Camp Geiger for a month, maybe a little over a month. And then after that, then I got placed into a, into a class. And then MCT, I believe, was about a month long. And what kinds of things did they teach you at MCT? Um, that that focused mainly on like combat type tactics. Um, we we had to do patrols, um, a lot of PT again. Um, we were out in the field pretty much the the entire time. Um, actually, we lived in these these wooden huts, and there was maybe it was just like a big open little room with windows all along the uh all on the walls and they were just netted windows so they weren't solid and uh, i think there was about 60 guys per per little hut there and um we would just be one right next to you know, uh, to each other sleeping on the floor so it wasn't even there was no racks no beds no uh no creature comforts of any kind in there and that was for 30 days you were at Camp Geiger? Um, roughly, if, if I remember correctly. I, I think it was about a month that we did that. Now, at that time, did you know you were being trained to go overseas? Um, no, I mean, by that time, I mean, we knew. I mean, the operations in Afghanistan were going on. Um, they hadn't yet started the initial invasion of Iraq. So, I mean, everybody kind of had a feeling in the back of their head that, you know, they could end up deploying overseas at some point. But when you're an MCT, at least for the Marine Corps, I mean, you still haven't received your, your MOS. So you don't know what job you're going to be yet. So you really weren't thinking, or at least I wasn't thinking that far ahead. Do you have any choice in what MOS uh, you get, or do they assign you to wherever they need people? For the most part, I think they assign you to to where they need you. But um, when you go to enlist and when you're sitting down with the recruiter, you can, based upon your ASVAB score, you're given a list of job fields in which there's maybe per for every field, there might be a half a dozen job descriptions within each field. So you could pick the field that you want to go into, and then you know, okay, I'm going to get one of these six jobs but you don't find out your specific job until you're about i think it, i can't remember if we were halfway through or towards the end of mct what field had you selected um i selected aviation support so there was i had uh i, I was either going to go into um aviation ordnance um or crash fire rescue something associated with that. So halfway through your MCT, you found out what your MOS was? Yep. I've, what was yours? Um, I was going into aviation ordinance. Can you tell me what that means? Um, at that point in time, it just meant that I was going to be dealing with uh, the weapon components on aircraft and dealing with um, the ordinance also that gets loaded onto those, onto those uh, aircraft. So... But it wasn't, it wasn't specific yet. At that point, I mean, I could have gone, uh, I mean, there's a whole range of aircraft that I could have been assigned to or, you know, different uh, maintenance levels. That, that isn't determined until later on in your schooling. So, but I knew I was going to be dealing with ordnance on, on aircraft. After your MCT training, where did you go? After MCT, I went to Pensacola, Florida, which is where my Ordnance A school, is what they called it, was. What does that mean? It's just your, your basic school to introduce you to, um, to aviation ordnance. So you just talked about the different types of bombs there were, the different type of launchers there were, the different type of aircraft there was. And it's really just a very basic class. How long did that last? Um, 
I, I think that was about a whole summer. I was down there for a summer. And where did you go after that? After that, I went to um, NAS Oceana in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And what does NAS? Um, that's Naval Air Station. And then that was where our C school was, which is the second school. And that was, um, that was more specialized. So at that point, um, I knew I was going to be assigned to an F-18 squadron. So in Oceana, I learned specifically about the F-18 and then the type of ordnance that specific jet carries, the specific systems on that jet, and that's what that school was for. Well, can you tell me about an F-18? What, what do you want to know? <laughs> In general, what is it? Um, it's a, it's a fighter attack aircraft that's used by the Navy and the Marine Corps. It comes in um, single-seater and two-seater forms, and uh, it's a very versatile jet. So you not only had to learn about the ordnance that it carried, you had to learn about the aircraft itself? You, like how, would you have to know how it worked mechanically? Um... Uh, Related to the ordnance systems, yes. What kind of ordnance systems does it have? It's um, it's mainly computerized, you know, electrical and mechanical components, combination of that. And uh, I mean, I really don't know how to how to describe it much more than that. It's been so long since I've really worked on it. So you would become an expert in what loading the ordnance? Yeah, we we would load the ordnance, and then also we'd have to troubleshoot the you know the, the mechanical and electrical components on the jet to make sure they were working properly. And then if we identified any bad parts, well then obviously we'd have to perform maintenance, um, remove and replace the bad component, and then you know run it up, and do a check to make sure everything is working properly. So after your training at C school, where did you go? Um, after that, then I was assigned to my unit, which was VMFA All Weather 224 out of Beaufort, South Carolina. And that was uh, an F-18 Delta Squadron, which means we're a two-seater jet. And where was it located? Beaufort, South Carolina. So you stayed there in Beaufort? That's where, yeah, that's where our home base was on MCAS Buford. And then from there, we deployed to wherever we needed to go. How long did you stay at Buford? Um, that was my home base for the, the remainder of my career. It's probably about three years. And what were the living conditions like there? Were you still living in Hutt? No, we were by, by, the time you, by the time you got to your uh, schools, you were, you were living in the barracks. Um, in Buford... They were actually the barracks were really nice. Um, yeah, you'd share the room with one roommate, and you know the rooms were carpeted. They had air conditioning. Um, you had uh, bunk beds that you could either leave stacked one on top of the other. Or you could separate them. Um, each marine had two closets in the room, and then there was um, a little vanity area with a sink, and um, you had a microwave and a refrigerator. And, and a bathroom. Yeah. So. Right. So while you were your three years at Buford, did you deploy to any place else? Um. Yeah, we deployed to Yuma, Arizona, on a somewhat regular basis for for training operations, and then we also did a six month Westpac tour of the West Pacific, where we we went to. Japan, Guam, and Australia. And what did you do there? Um, just training. You know, depending on where we were, to, depended on what we were doing exactly. Um, when we were in Australia, there were bombing ranges down there, so we did a lot of um, work with live ordnance, loading live ordnance on the jets, and and getting um, getting experience doing that. And then it was you know just traveling around, being able to to pack your things up and go on a moment's notice, it, it, it all helped with that. So. How long were you gone on Westpac? Uh, six months. Where else did you deploy? 
Um, it's on Westpac or in general? In general. Uh, we, then we also did a, uh, a tour in Iraq in 2005. Where in Iraq did you go? Uh, Al Assad Air Base. Can you spell that? I think it's A L A S A D. A S A D, yeah. And that was in 2005? That was, yeah, we were there from January until August. And can you tell me what you did there? Um, there, our mission was to provide air support to um, U.S. ground forces and coalition forces in Iraq. So what would uh, your daily schedule be like? Um, well, we had the, uh, the squadron was divided into two crews, a day crew and a night crew. Each crew worked um, a 12-hour shift with a one-hour overlap at the beginning and end of each shift. So I think it turned out to be closer to 14 hours. Each, for each crew had to put in and uh, there would just be I mean you'd have launches that went out throughout the, uh, the period of the day and our responsibilities were to make sure that the uh, the aircraft were up and, uh, and operational so that they could go out and perform their sorties and then we had to load the ordnance on all the jets and and perform any any maintenance that was required troubleshooting as required and uh, I mean that's that's it in a nutshell now did you go to Iraq with the same group of Marines that you were stationed at Buford with yes so you knew your squad when you went over yes yeah all, all yeah we we'd all trained together and for the most part the most of us had been together for for a while there we had a handful of, of brand new guys that um literally had checked into the squadron just days before we deployed. Um, I think they were kind of shocked. They had heard rumors that we might be deploying, but some of them didn't believe it until they got there. So, <laughs> Did you have any leave uh, and a chance to go home before you deployed to Iraq? Yeah. Yeah, we all. The, the, the squadron gave everybody the opportunity to go home for for a couple couple weeks I think or it d depended on how long you requested but yeah I think I went home for two weeks before we deployed do you remember what your impression was when you first arrived in Iraq um well we arrived it was like I said it was in January and um, we arrived in in the middle of the night it was extremely cold um, I actually remember there was there was we had an issue landing with our, our aircraft, I think we were on a C-5, and I don't know exactly what happened, but we had to do an emergency landing, and um, and then once we landed, they were, uh, they were I, I can't remember exactly what was happening, but we were in the middle of the, of, of the runway on the flight line, and then I guess the APU caught on fire, and so they, uh, they wanted to... Um, we had to evacuate the plane, and they went to. Actually, yeah, they, they wanted us to evacuate the plane for whatever reason, and they they uh, they released the slide for life, and then I guess that didn't inflate, and then that got sucked into the APU. Yeah, that's what happened, and the APU caught on fire. What's and, the APU? Ah, uh, I can't remember what it stands for. It's like a little, if I remember correctly, it's a well, relatively small compared to the rest of the engines on the jet, but it. it when the, those, the main engines that allow the jet to fly aren't running, this APU would run, and that would provide like electrical power, oh. hydraulic power, and, and everything to the jet while it's, uh, while it's parked, waiting to turn up, or, or whatever. Wow. You yeah. weren't even in battle yet, and you were already in an emergency. Yeah, what it was... What happened? Did you all get out of the Yeah, we, ev we evac... No, we had, to, we had to evacuate the plane, just exiting out the... <laughs> out the, the regular exits, and, um, and then we all lined up on the side of the flight line. And I remember it was cold. Uh, most of us, we didn't have any, we just had like our t-shirts on and our camis, you know, so it was probably in the single digits. And we were out there for probably a, an hour at least, maybe even two hours before a bus came and, and brought us to where we were gonna be staying. But I remember the first thing a bunch of us did was we, uh, 
when we got off the plane and we just looked around and we're all like, what the hell? And we all just took a piss. <laughs> and so that's, that was how we welcome to, welcome Iraq. to Iraq. We're going to piss on this country. That's what we did. So once you got in your bar, did you have regular barracks? Um, we had what we called tins, which were these narrow little huts, I guess you could call them. They were, you know, they were made out of aluminum or whatever. It looked like they, they could be picked up with a fork truck. And they were just stacked one next to the other in rows. And we stayed in those. And so there was, there was two Marines per tin. And again, and inside there was, uh, there were pretty much two beds that you got to stack in bunk bed form or you could separate. So there were two Marines in each of those tins? In each of those tins, yeah. Now, do you have any memorable experiences that you can recall from your time at Al Assad Air Base? Um, well, yeah, I mean, there was. You know, you're with you're with your, you know, your fellow Marines that you trained with for the past few years, and you develop good relationships with. So, I mean, you had a, there was a lot of. I don't want to really say it was downtime, but it seemed like downtime because there just wasn't a lot to do. It was a lot of just maintaining the flight schedule, and um, so you know, when jets are out flying, there, you know, unless there was maintenance to be performed on another jet ordinance to load or whatnot you know you'd have a lot of slow moments so there'd be a lot of time or we'd be just be sitting around talking about home telling stories um telling jokes some people a lot of people had their laptops sometimes we'd watch movies on our laptops um so i mean there were there were there were a lot of good times so to speak i guess as good as they could have been <laughs> considering where you were you, you make you make do you you find stuff to do to keep you occupied and maintain your, a certain level of sanity. Were you or your unit involved in any combat? Um, no, I mean, we're, we weren't a combat unit in the sense that we we're on the front lines, but we, our squadron did drop ordnance in combat zones. So, I mean, in that, that sense, yeah, we were involved, but we weren't, we weren't, um, you know, firing on the enemy or ourselves personally or anything Were like that. Were there any casualties in your unit? No. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Um, I was given, let's see, I have uh, the Marine Corps Good Conduct Medal, um, the Iraqi Campaign Medal, National Defense Service Medal, um, Global War on Terrorism Service Medal, and uh, the two overseas deployment ribbons and a meritorious unit citation. Joe, I'm going to ask you some questions about daily life in the service. Okay. How did you stay in touch with family when you were in Iraq? Um, mostly through... Well, I guess through a combination of email, handwritten letters, and um, the occasional phone call. Did you have access to email at any time you wanted to? Yeah, there was um, a, a building that was designated for, um, they had a room with, I can't remember how many computers, but there may be maybe a dozen, I want to say, computers and a dozen telephones. And, uh, and then they also had a TV and a bunch of board games and books. And there may have even been a pool table there. Now I can't remember. But so that was open every day. But that was for um, every unit that was on that side of the base. So you go in there, you may be waiting in line for a few hours to get on a computer or to get on a telephone. And then once, once you got a computer or a telephone, you were, you were allowed one hour. To, to be to use the equipment and then you'd be taken off so somebody else could have a turn or an opportunity so how often would you usually use the phone or the email um 
maybe a couple times a week. I mean, it would depend. So Some, if you had downtime, basically, you could go in there anytime you wanted? If you had downtime, yeah, you could go in there almost any time you wanted. If you wanted to wait in line. But, I mean, a lot of the the thing was, you know, you'd come off your shift, you just put in 14 hours, you're tired, you know, and if you got to wait in line for an hour or two to, to get on a computer, you know, sometimes that wasn't the most appealing thing to do. Um, something that my my shop did when we were over there is we gave um, every Marine got a, I think for part of the deployment, we would, yeah, they paired us up where two Marines would get a day off a week. And then I think towards the end, because it was uh, putting too much of a demand or a strain on the crew, each Marine got a day off every two weeks. So then, you know, that would give you a solid day to, to be able to find time to, to go there and either just catch up on sleep or to go send emails and make telephone calls or, or just do whatever that individual Marine needed to do. Take some time for himself. What was the food like? Um, yeah, it wasn't terrible. Uh, it wasn't great, I don't think, but I, I don't remember it being absolutely terrible either. Did you have a regular mess hall? At first, we didn't. Um, there was one on the other side of the base. It was where we were. I mean, Al Assad was a very large base. How, and, how large are we talking? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know the dimensions of it, but maybe just to give you an idea, we were. We were on the south side of the base, and then there was the other side, which was called main side, and it would be about a half an hour drive from south side to main side. So. So it's pretty big. It was geographically. How yeah. about numbers of men or squadrons? That I I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, because like I said, we were we were the only squadron at the time that we, we arrived there that was operating out of the south side of the base. Um, actually, I think there there might have been a C-130 squadron How over there. And then the I think there's maybe 250 in, a, in our squadron, if I remember correctly. And that's maintainers and air crew combined, I think. So when you first got there, where did you have to go to eat? Um, well, they had a, they had a tent that was set up there and that was only there for maybe a week and then they took that down and then they were um and then what we'd have to do is for every meal we would have to drive a humvee to the main side of the base and then pick up these chow vats they were called just these big plastic insulated uh vats that they would put the the chow in and then, so then we'd bring those back to the squadron and then set them up buffet style. And, uh, and then, you know, each shop would take turns going through the chow tent or where we had it set up and putting together a plate of chow. And if we didn't have time or, you know, if it just wasn't logistically possible to, to go down there and get the chow from the main side of the base, well, then we had a supply of MREs that the squadron could, uh, could pick from to eat. But then we, we were doing that, and then I can't remember at which point how far into the deployment. I want to say a little bit further past the halfway point or right around there, they, they did put a, a chow hall up um, on that side of the base for us so that we didn't have to drive all over the place to, to get chow. Did you have enough supplies material things uh clothing that kind of stuff yeah i mean there wasn't really much to do there other than to work so all we really needed was um you know your desert camouflage utilities um being that we were aircraft maintainers we we each maintainer probably had at least two or three sets of uh, coveralls which they could wear in place of you know their their camouflage utilities they were generally they were cooler so i personally preferred wearing those over the over the camis but yeah i mean we felt that we had enough did you feel pressure or stress yeah oh yeah there was definitely stress out there and how did you deal with stress um like i said most of us i mean we i, I guess every individual had their own 
way of dealing with their individual stresses. But for the most part, we would just try and when there was some downtime or it was slow, we would just try and tell jokes, tell stories, um, just anything to try and pass the time. There really was a lot of um, a lot of slow time. Do you do anything special for good luck? Special for good luck? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, my mother, right before I went, she gave me this little medallion that had um, St. Michael on it. She gave me that for good luck. So I, I wore that on my uh, with my dog tags. But other than that, no. What did you do for entertainment? Um... You know, we tell jokes, take pictures. Um, I had this one or a couple of buddies and I, we, we would make these little videos. We'd escape for a little while and make little comical videos um, of us doing just silly stuff. Okay. Right, so Joe, uh, would you describe a little bit more in detail about the ordinance that you would be using in Iraq? Um, yeah, the stuff that we dealt with over there were um, AIM-9 Sidewinder missiles. A-9? AIM-9, A-I-M. Oh. Um, air intercept missile. And uh, and then 500-pound bombs, either laser-guided or GPS-guided. Um, it could have been one or the other. And then we were also using um, AGM-65s, which were also known as Mavericks air-to-ground missile and uh, and then the jets had the uh, I think if I remember correctly the M61 A1 six barrel Gatlin gun pretty much made by General Electric which was a 20 millimeter cannon so they call it I right, see so you now, what would your job be to to load all these weapons? So, like, if you had how many AIM-9 Sidewinder missiles would, would an aircraft carry? Um, our jets carry two, one on each wingtip. And uh, so, on each mission, you'd have to load those two Sidewinder missiles. Yeah, generally, I mean, you know, once you, they were already on the jets, and so it wasn't like you had to take them off in between each mission. Um, for the most part, the stuff, once you loaded it on there, it could stay on there. Um, unless, you know, the jet needed to, to go in for a certain type of maintenance where we needed to remove it or if we needed to take it from one jet to another jet or, or whatever. But for the most part, once you loaded a jet, it could stay configured that way until either the jet dropped some ordnance or the jet needed to come down for maintenance or there was an order to reconfigure. And how many 500-pound bombs would they carry in addition to the Sidewinder? Um, again, it would depend on uh, the configuration for the, the missions that they're going out for. Um, so they could carry either one or two. Um, it really depended. On so would every mission be different depending on where they were going? They would tell you what kind of ordinance they wanted? For the most part, we flew with the... With with uh, that ordinance that I that I listed earlier, you know, one of each pretty much. Um, but yeah, I mean, depending on, I mean, if a mission called for, you know, two 500 pound bombs, well then we would load two of those on instead of one. And I think towards the end of the deployment, we actually started flying all jets with two, two of the 500 pound bombs, um, if I remember correctly. Did but, they always drop those? Did they ever return with their ordinance? Um, actually, we, we really didn't drop all that much. Um, I think we dropped somewhere around 70,000 pounds or just under, um, which may sound like a lot, but when you consider, you know, we'd go out to Yuma, Arizona for training for like a month. I remember there was one month out there. The first time I went with my squadron, I think we dropped like 320,000 pounds of ordnance in four weeks, just to give you an idea. So... I mean, we weren't dropping stuff every single day. Um, for the most part, our jets were, they were up in the air in the event 
that people on the ground needed air support and they could call on our jets and they wouldn't have to wait because, you know, they were just already up there. Um, so there were definitely, I think there were a few missions where, you know, we knew that we were going to be dropping. We anticipated it. Um, there was one, I remember one night, it was on Mother's Day actually, that, uh, that was a, a busy night. That was, you know, it was a night that we were anticipating a strike or several strikes. And so, you know, the jets were, they were going out, they were dropping, coming back, we'd reload them and then they'd go back out. So, you know. Did you ever know, you Marines on the ground, did you ever know where the jets were going to? Uh, usually not. Like I said, they'd be flying up in the air and then if somebody needed them, they'd call. I mean, I don't understand exactly how it all worked um, because it it wasn't my job, but I guess they would communicate with somebody or, you know, put out a radio call and they'd put them in contact with with our pilots and then the pilots would go to where they're needed. But I I think that there, there was probably some sort of a flight path or flight schedule that, you know, that they were, um, that they had to stick to. I mean, I'm sure there were zones that they were patrolling or certain cities that they were patrolling, but. Now, did you have to carry any weapons on you, yourself? Um... We were, we were all issued, you know, M16s with uh, 60 rounds, two magazines at 30 rounds. Um, We were, yeah, we were instructed to have them with us at all times. Obviously, while maintaining, you know, working on the jet, I didn't, you know, you didn't have an M16 strapped to your back while you're working on the jet or loading bombs. Um, at the beginning, we did because we were where they had us located on the base. It was right near the perimeter, and that was, and it was a relatively unpatrolled perimeter. Uh, and so there was, you know, uh, there. At first, we were nervous. You know, we didn't know what to expect, that people could breach the perimeter. I mean, al-Assad did receive mortar and rocket fire on a semi-regular basis, I would say. But it was such a big base where, let's say the majority of the time that the, you know, mortars are raining in, they weren't really hitting anywhere of any any significance. But once in a while, they would definitely hit some areas that were, um, that were significant. Like, I remember one time they hit... Um, one of the fuel pits on the main side of the base where uh, where I would go, uh, and also my my uh, my day crew counterpart would go to, to refuel the Humvee uh, when it would need to be refueled. So a mortar or something hit one of the fifty five thousand gallon fuel bladders, the diesel fuel, um, and that caused a pretty pretty hefty explosion. Needless to say, in a and a huge fire and a massive cloud of smoke that burned for a very long time. Um, I actually have some pictures of that I can I can share with you. But uh, well, I know you had said earlier you had there was a close uh, was it rocker rocket or mortar attack where, near where you were. Yeah, there was, it was. I believe it was in the spring and. Um, they, the insurgents, they must have kind of figured out that we were operating or something was going on on that side of the base where we were, and it seemed like they, it's possible that they kind of honed in on our location. A rocket landed maybe within like 100, 150 meters of, uh, of where we were, um, you know, left a crater. Some guys dug it up, um, so... But, you know, mortars would come in. You know, you have the air raid sirens. I mean, at the beginning, you know, it would be more often than not. And then it seemed to gradually die down as uh, as the deployment where, you know, went on. Now, what were you supposed to do when you heard the air raid siren? Uh, did you have, like, a battle station or a protocol of what you were supposed to do? Take cover. If you were, if you were the crew that was at the tins, you know, our orders were to, to go to our tin or stay indoors under cover until the air raid siren, um, until we heard the siren turn off, and at which point then you would congregate together for a roll call to make sure everybody was was, uh, accounted for. And if we were on the flight line, again, our orders were to take cover um, unless there were launches going out, at which point um, 
only you know necessary personnel required for you know troubleshooting on the flight line what they were required to go out and troubleshoot on the flight line because whether or not we were we had uh incoming you know they were we still had to get the jets out so and being that i was on the rmd arm crew there would be there were several times that i would be out in the rmd arm area you know waiting for the jets to come out so i could arm them up and you know the air raid siren would come on and we just have to sit out there and wait you know because our job is to get those jets out how many jets were you responsible for in any given mission how many jets would usually be taken off Talking well, there were. Five or 50. I mean, it, it depended. Um, there were twelve jets in the squadron, so but usually jets they went out in pairs. So you know, you may only have two jets going out. There may have been four jets going out. You could have as many as six jets going out. I mean, it just depended on the time of day. From what I remembered, it seemed like, um, you know, there was a pretty set routine, flight schedule that remained fairly consistent day to day and so uh you know and, and as i said you'd have maybe two to four, i'd say average two to four jets per launch but it, it just depended i remember there were there were definitely some launches where there were more than that going out did you become friendly with the pilots and the crews or did you maintain separate uh I mean, for the most part, we maintain. You know, we were we were separate from them because you know they were officers. We were enlisted. Um, but yeah, I, I, at the same time, you know, you, you could develop um, limited relationships with some of the air crew. Um, you know, I'd joke around with them when they come out for launches. Sometimes they would come around to the workstations and check up on the guys and the morale and and hang out and and uh, do whatever. But I mean, as far as us hanging out with officers no i mean that that didn't happen for the most part officers stuck to themselves and the enlisted you know we kind of did our own thing now can you in general describe just generally what it was like um during your time in iraq what was the general atmosphere like i know you had talked a little bit about the hurry up and wait um, if there was a lot of that yeah, there was. I mean, you pretty much said it. Hurry up and wait. I think that's something that, at the very least, every Marine can relate to, um, if not other branches of service. But yeah, it was. The, you'd have times where you would be extremely busy, running around like a chicken with your head cut off, and then all of a sudden, be the exact opposite, very slow, um, looking for something to do trying to stay alert, trying to stay vigilant. Um, the, I mean, you go from one extreme to the other. And, and then during the those slow periods, you know, was, the slow periods were more often than the busy periods. So, you know, there's a lot of boredom. Um, and that's when, and that's when, you know, we would all sit together, tell jokes, tell stories, talk about what we're going to do when we get home, talk about the first beer we were going to drink, or, you know, the married guys talk about wanting to, can't wait to see their wives. Um, I had a good friend of mine who's, whose first baby was born when we were deployed over there, you know, so he would talk about how he couldn't wait to see his, his newborn daughter. Um, you know, things like that. What did you miss most about home? trees and um time off you know having having the freedom to to go to the store or um to see family um i guess that ready access you know or, or instant access so to speak to to friends and family you know just take your cell phone out of your pocket and make a phone call you know it wasn't it wasn't that easy over there because you know you, you may you may have the energy and the time at some point to to wait in line and get on a phone but i think there was like a 13 or a 14 hour time difference so between you know over there and, and back here so i think every time i would end up calling home it'd be the middle of the night and uh you know i'd be waking somebody up or that's if they would get to the phone um so even even 
if you were able to get to a phone while you're over there, you weren't necessarily to make a, able to make a contact back home. I mean, there were a lot of things that had to happen <laughs> mm-hmm. for for communication to take place. Did you prefer the extremely busy times or the slow looking for something to stay awake time? <laughs> I think that's uh, that's a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> When you were when you were really really busy, oh, you couldn't wait for a slow time, and then when you were really really slow, you couldn't wait for something to happen. Um, you know, a lot of times something happening wasn't necessarily what you wanted to happen. So, you know, it was the grass is greener on the other side type of deal. Um, but for the most part, I think I think we would have rather have had a little bit more to more to do. Um, something to keep you occupied. I mean, when you, when you weren't, when you were maintaining the jet, when you you had a maintenance evolution going on, or if you had to load a certain jet or unload or, or whatever, when you had a project, you're, you were busy, your, your mind was occupied. And, and that was a good thing is when, when you didn't have a specific task and you were allowed, your mind was allowed to wander and and your thoughts were allowed to drift. That was, uh, you know, that was probably the worst part because, you know, you start thinking about anything. <laughs> and uh, depending on what was going on in, in an individual's life at that point in time, you know, you, you could you could find yourself in a pretty lonely place at times. And I imagine that a lot of the Marines... Did you have um, any USO shows come to your base? Any entertainers from the outside? Not that I can remember. Do you have any of those comical videos that you made? Yes, I do. I have them on my laptop. And then also from time to time, the uh, they would give us what was called a maintenance day, which would be a, uh, a no-fly day for the, for the squadron. And um, it was intended to provide us an opportunity to catch up with any maintenance that we may be behind on. But generally what, what we would do as a squadron is in anticipation of that maintenance day, we would try and make sure that all of our maintenance was taken care of so that we could have a squadron-wide day off. And so once in a while, we had a couple couple of those days where we um, we had a squadron barbecue out there. I remember um, my, my gunnery sergeant at the time, Gunnery Sergeant McFadden, he, um, him and a bunch of other guys, they made a smoke pit and we had a, we had a pig roast out there and that was that was pretty fun so it was kind of a little taste of home that we had and they brought in a bunch of non-alcoholic beer for us to drink and um you know and then, you know some some people would be playing basketball or or volleyball we had a volleyball net so we set that up um and some of the some of the marines that played instruments they brought some of their musical instruments over so they actually uh we had a band that was actually made up of some of the air crew, the officers, and they would play music. So that was that was a nice treat. Once in a while, we got to do that. I I, I want to say maybe we did that three or four times over the course of the eight months that we were there. Well, did you have any leave while you were over in Iraq? No. Did you ever leave the base? No. Do you recall any particularly humorous or unusual events while you were over there? Humorous or un- unusual events? Yeah. Um, any pranks you used to play on each other or funny things that happened? Yeah, th- there was this one time, this would be a, a personal joke between uh, myself and a buddy so that no one would probably get, but I had, uh, shortly before we deployed, I'd gotten into a car accident. And, um, and the wheel flew off my car and they, they couldn't find it at the scene of the accident. So I went back later on and I found this wheel and, um, I kept it, you know, at at the barracks and I left it outside one of my buddy's rooms. And so before we went to Iraq, you know, I was getting ready to take it back and he had hid it from me. He says, oh, you left it outside my room as a gift. So I thought it was mine. And he actually had it TMO'd, which I can't remember what TMO stands for, but that's when like the, 
whatever company that the Marine Corps uses to store your personal belongings when you're deployed. Well, he gave that to them to store for him. And so he, the big joke was he had my wheel. And so uh, when we were out in Iraq, I found this big wheel that probably belonged to like a five-ton truck or something. And uh, I figured since my buddy liked wheels so much, he wanted to keep my wheel. I figured I'd give him this one. And so we used uh, the SATS loader, which is um, kind of like a fork truck that we use to help us carry some of the heavy ordnance and use it to load onto the jets. I took the SATS loader and we brought this wheel from the flight line wherever we found it over to his tin. And uh, we got into his tin and I put it in there. So when he came home from work, he had this big, massive wheel that... Uh, took up you know a good chunk of his room I actually probably got a picture of it somewhere I could good. I could conclude I bet he knew right where it came from oh yeah he <laughs> knew he knew where it came from you recall any other unusual events um I don't know everything out there was kind of unusual because it was it was different from what you were used to this when sandstorms would come rolling in that was pretty different can you describe what it would be like um, I, I mean, just imagine sand everywhere at times so thick where you could put your hand out in front of you and you could barely see your hand. Um, you'd have to cover your, you know, your face and, and your nose and your mouth so that you don't breathe it in. Um, when these sandstorms came, pretty much you weren't going outside. Uh, they were windy, really, really windy. Um, and, uh, how often would they occur? Um, I think they were more often towards the end of the deployment at the uh, during the warmer weather months, but um, I, I can't remember exactly how many we had. But I think they started in the spring, and then. But I mean, would it be like once a week, once a month? You know that I every six months. That I really can't remember. I mean, it's you could have maybe one in a week or two in a week, and then not have one for a couple weeks, or. Okay. I mean, they were kind of sporadic. Do you know when they're coming up, or does it just come on you? They just kind of came up on us. I mean, I don't know if they had some kind of like a detecting service, you know, like, you know, you can like detect the weather, weather here. If they had that, I mean, we'd get some heads up um, that there might be one coming in or as one was coming in so that we could button up all of our jets and and ground everything because when these when these rolled through you weren't you weren't performing maintenance you weren't doing anything you weren't um there weren't any launches going out i mean you're, you're pretty much grounded and halted all operations and um and you just kind of have to sit around and wait for them to pass which could sometimes take a while did you have any problems adjusting to the climate um i mean I mean, yes and no. You know, having grown up in New England, I was used to you know cold winters and and fairly warm summers. And and when we got there, it was it was cold. I mean, it, like I said, at night it would uh, it would get down into the single digits. Um, I actually remember there being a couple instances where I saw negative digits um, on the thermometer. The because, uh, like I said, as I said earlier, when we would we would have to replace a component on the jet or load a piece of ordnance or whatever. We'd have to run that jet up and make sure everything was communicating properly. And so you'd be in the cockpit, or at least one Marine would be in the cockpit while conducting these checks. And one of the gauges gave you a, uh, a temperature readout inside the engine compartment. And I remember one time being in the cockpit performing a check and looking down and, and seeing that it was negative 8 degrees in the engine compartment. So... It, it got brutally cold. Um, we'd be wearing at night four layers. You know, we'd have like long johns on, and then um, um, I can't remember what they were called, but like these other long sweat type shirts, and then a fleece, and then your coveralls or your camis, and then you'd have like scarves and beanies and gloves and super thick socks. And it, sometimes that still wasn't all enough. You know, if you get a good wind coming, you know, the wind would go right through that. Well, I'm um, guessing those tins weren't insulated. No, it would get cold in there, too. All we had to heat those was, like, you know, one of those little 
area heaters that you you know you have for at home you know that you plug into the wall and it's just like a little element that heats up and glows red that's what we use to heat the tins with um but i remember it would be i mean it would be cold and i was i was on the rmd arm crew when uh when we were out there which was pretty much when you had the jets going out on a launch um you couldn't arm the ordnance on the on the line there because a lot of it was forward firing and if there was a short or something you know it caused a lot of damage to your own equipment so we would there'd be a small crew of about three of us that would go out to the end of the flight line and we would wait for the jets you know once they did all the troubleshooting then the jets would come to us and then they would face down the flight line which there would be nothing in front of them and at that point we would arm up all the ordnance and then they would take off from right there you can do that from outside the aircraft yeah yeah you have to and but i remember we'd, we'd be out there and you'd have to wait for these jets you know you'd probably sometimes be out there for close to an hour um depending on whether or not they had trouble on the line and uh it'd be cold it'd be so cold that uh, we'd be sitting on the engine of the humvee while it was running to, to stay warm all right now i know you do have photographs that were attached to this record mm -hmm. Uh, what did you think of your fellow Marines, and what did you think of the officers? Uh, they, they were all great, uh, for the most part. You know, after after being out there and being with each other for so long and having no outlet, you know, you can't really get away from each other. Obviously, emotions ran high at times, but for the most part, it was um, that was the best group of guys that that I could have asked to have been with over there and um you know we all really looked out for each other did you stay in touch with any of your buddies after you left iraq yes yeah i kept in touch with a good good portion of them as time has gone by you know obviously some of us has dr have drifted apart but um we still all try to keep in touch with each other and and you know find out how someone's doing if it's not through direct contact you know through talking to somebody else did you keep a diary while you were overseas um you know that's actually something that i wish i had done or had been a little bit more consistent with i i did start a diary at um and, and i wrote in it you know at random points throughout my entire enlistment but i i didn't keep one diligently when I was out in Iraq and that's one of the things I uh, actually regret not having done. What did you think of the officers? I mean, they were all they were they all seemed really good. I mean there were a few that you know you, you didn't really care for and the same thing with enlisted guys but you know for the most part they're a really good group of guys. Um, we didn't really deal with them too much directly, you know, because we were maintainers and they were air crew. But the interactions that we did have, they, they were positive. Where did you go after you finished your deployment in Iraq? Um, we well, came back home to Beaufort. And that was in August? That was in August. Of 2000? Of 2005. What was that like coming home after serving overseas? Um, it was just absolutely amazing. It's the only thing I could really think. You know, when you're out there, not having seen a a tree or anything green for that matter, um, you know, coming home and just see, as far as you could see, green trees, green grass. It was it was quite a shock. And it, but a pleasant shock. <laughs> <laughs> when you um, got back home, did you have a, an opportunity for leave to go home? Yeah, uh, but we all had to wait about 30 days before we could take leave. So, and I guess that was just so they could keep an eye on us, make sure, you know, nobody was going to do anything crazy. But, uh, yeah, we did, have, we did have opportunities to go home after that 30-day period. So after your leave and you went back to Buford, and what did you do for the rest of your tour while you were stationed at Buford? Um, just 
it was back to the daily routine of uh, just training back at home. So, you know, no more dealing with live ordinance really and just, you know, it was a relatively laid back um, or more laid back, I should say, routine, you know, back to back to more normal hours. Um, you know, no more 14 hour days, you know, you know, typical your nights and weekends off and um, a, lot less stressful. A, lo- a lot less stressful. Yeah. And I was getting ready to, to get out anyway. So I think I, uh, you know, I, I didn't really do all that much personally. So other than just start preparing for, um, for separation. And when when did you separate? When were you done? I went on terminal leave just before Christmas. So I think maybe December 23rd or somewhere around there. I mean, it was literally days before Christmas. I checked out on terminal leave. So what, do you recall your last day in service? Um... Yeah, actually, we we were the squadron was getting ready for a uh, for some big inspection, and so a, a lot of you know we had to make sure all our you know dress uniforms were squared away, all our um, paperwork were squared away, all our we just we had to make sure everything was was on the money. It was some, it was like a big audit, and so I had to buy all new alphas which was the green dress uniform because the one that was issued, issued to me in boot camp was a little tight. You know, I've grown since then. And uh, they made me buy a whole new uniform like two weeks prior to me checking out, you know, which I was pissed about because it cost me like $300, $350. Um, a uniform that I never had to wear, but they made me buy it. And you know, I tried to not do it. So I remember having to deal with that and not being too happy about it. But that's the type of stuff that we used to all joke about, you know, the stupid things that the Marine Corps would make you do. Um, the stuff that didn't make sense, which there was plenty of other things that they made us do that didn't make any sense. But I remember that. Um, I remember the last night that I was there, a um, bunch of the, the Marines in my shop will... There, there was a handful of us who used to go down to Savannah, Georgia every weekend and, and go out drinking down there. And then, you know, once in a while, the whole shop would go. Well, there was, you know, there was a group of people that um, that took a, took me down to Savannah that last night out. And, um, you know, so we were doing our, you know, our normal routine that we would have out there, hit the bars and the clubs and drinking. And I remember at the... Uh, at the end of the night, when all the bars and clubs closed down, there was all these hot dog vendors that would set up right outside the uh, the clubs, and they'd sell hot dogs to all the drunk people coming out. And so we were my group. We were at one of these hot dog vendors, and we all had our you know military haircuts. And Savannah is actually more of an army town than than a Marine Corps town, but you know a lot of us went down there anyway. But a lot of people that were down there, they would just assume that we were in the army. So you get a lot of people coming up to you asking if you were in the army. And um, this one guy came up to one of my buddies and he, and he goes, "Are are you in the army?" And he goes, um, "Army sucks my balls." So that's exactly what he says. And and the guy just looks at him. And he goes, "Well, my dad's in the army." And so my buddy goes, well, I guess that means your dad sucks my balls. <laughs> and it was an instant brawl, instant fight right there in the streets of Savannah. And, I mean, elbows are flying and everybody's diving in. I remember I had a, glasses and they got knocked off my face. And it was so big. The police, they came and they didn't even want to get involved. They just kind of, like, stood on the on the uh, sidelines until it uh, <laughs> until it cleared out. But uh, that was, yeah, that was my last night with the, with the guys out in town. Got in a big fight. Oh, wow. <laughs> I guess that was memorable. So you flew home the next day? Uh, I drove home. Oh, so you were close enough to drive home? Yeah. What did you do in the uh, days and weeks after your discharge? Um, I guess I just came home and 
started uh, getting stuff ready to come back to school. Um, I started looking for a job. I wanted to try and work for a while before I went back to school or maybe hoping that I could land a job that might not require me to have to go back to school. Um, I had a lot of trouble finding a job um, or finding an employer that didn't want to take complete advantage of you, uh, which was tough. A lot of people just wanted to take advantage of you. So as it turned out, I, I couldn't really find much and I ended up um, taking unemployment for six months. And a buddy uh, that I actually served with overseas, um, he was in my unit. We, we went and took a little road trip. Uh, we were gonna go, uh, our original plan was to go all around the country. But when we got down to New Orleans, I had to, I had to back out at that point. Unfortunately, I was having some car problems. We were taking my car. And so, and I figured it probably wasn't the most responsible thing to do to take, uh, go on a road trip being funded by unemployment. <laughs> so. So you went back to school. And yep. I understand you're a student at Central Connecticut State University now. Yep, currently a student. This is my, my last year. Um, I'm a history major with a minor in religious studies. And did you use the GI Bill? Yes. Financial education? Yes, I'm currently um, taking advantage of the GI Bill and um, also the State of Connecticut's tuition waiver program for veterans. Did you join any veterans organizations? Um, for a while, I was uh, an active member in the VFW. Um, I should probably um, re reactivate my membership, come to think of it. But then I'm also actively um, been involved with the Veterans Appreciation Organization, which is a student club here on campus, which this year I'm currently the, uh, the president. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, it's, uh, it's a club whose purpose is to raise awareness to the fact that veterans are present in the student population as well as the community outside of the student population. And, um, you know, we're a group of people that are, that are here and we, um, it's just a ra pretty much just to raise awareness. You know, there's a lot of uh, misinformation out there about vets and what we do and who we are. And this is to try and clear some of that misinformation. No, you'll graduate this May? Hopefully. <laughs> That's the plan. And what do you plan to do after that? Be a guy with a history degree. <laughs> <laughs> Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Um, well, I, I don't see how it couldn't influence the way you look at war and, and military service in general. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Can you elaborate on that a little bit, on, on how it influenced it? Um, well, you know, prior to having been a participant in, in a war, you know, it's, uh, you don't really have a very good understanding of, to what war is really all about. Um, you know, it's usually just something up until that point, something I read about in a book, watched in a movie, very easy to romanticize about. And then um, after having participated in one, you, you, you get you get a sense of the other side of it. And it's not always as um, colorful as Hollywood and popular literature and culture sometimes portrays it to be. So I always tell people, you know, my, my experience in the, in the Marine Corps has uh, given me the opportunities to see some of the best sides of humanity as well as some of the worst sides of humanity. How would you say the military affected your life? Um, well, I never thought that I would be involved with, you know, veterans um, stuff like I am now. So obviously, you know, it, it's affected my life in that, that regard. Um, I never really thought I was going to become a history major. Um, so I, I've always kind of been interested in history. And I think 
having been stationed in Beaufort, South Carolina, which, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we were only about 45 minutes north of Savannah, Georgia, about an hour south of Charleston, South Carolina, which both those cities are very rich in history. Um, and so I, I had an opportunity to explore a lot of that while I was down there and that kind of um, fed my interest. So, and I, and I definitely think that that influenced where I, where I am today. Is there anything else that you can recall that I haven't asked you about? Any other stories or incidents um, that, I, that I haven't asked you about that you'd like to include? Oh, there's there's tons of stories and <laughs> things that I could talk about. It's just a matter of which one. Well, why don't you pick one? Why don't I pick one? Um, well, let me ask you, the interviewers, any any different uh, particular time period you want me to like, a Westpac story, Iraq story, an or, Iraq story, an Iraq story. Um. You have to give me a minute here. Well, Westpac, if you can recall anything that happened on Westpac. That's six months out to sea, right? Well, no, we we weren't on a boat, so you're bouncing around from, you know, one base to another. So when we got, like, initially we went to Iwakuni, Japan, which is where we were kind of, that was like our home base, so to speak. And then from Iwakuni. That's on shore? That's on shore. Everywhere we went was on shore. So, from there, you know, I'm trying to remember the exact order of everything we did, we went to um, we went to Australia. After that, and on our way to Australia, we spent um, a night in Guam, which was wild. That was crazy. Um, everybody had a blast. I don't think anybody slept that night. We were all out in town drinking and doing whatever, and um, and then we went to Australia. We were in Australia in Darwin which is the northern, I think, most city in, in the country of Australia. We were there for about five weeks. And as I mentioned earlier, that's where we were doing a lot of, um, you know, training with live ordnance. So, and doing live drops. And we were training alongside of uh, the Australian Air Force, you know, so we were doing operations with them. Like the whole time that we were on Westpac, everywhere we were, we were, you know, we were training with other you know, U.S. forces as well as Japanese defense forces, Australian forces. Um, you know, I really can't remember all the. Well, that must have been all the groups Did you actually interact with the Australian forces, or was um, it your camp and their camp? It was, for the most part, it was like our camp and their camp, but we did, you know, get to meet them a little bit. Uh, like obviously, we were in Australia. We we're working off of, you know, out of an Australian base. So it was Australians that, you know, that kind of showed us the flight line. And so there were a couple of days we worked with them and they, they just kind of showed us the, the routine and, you know, how to, because when, you, when you're going on to the flight line, you know, you'd have to cross away, uh, cross, across an, uh, an active runway. So you'd have to communicate with the tower and this and that. So they kind of taught us the jargon and, and the manner in which they did it because it, it was a little different than us and then where we needed to go and, and whatnot. So... And then there were a couple times, you know, out in town that we'd get to meet up with some of these guys and, and we'd, you know, drink with them and share stories and, you know. Did you get to travel in Australia or Japan or Guam while you were there or were you not there long enough? Oh, yeah, you got to sightsee. I mean, when, you're, when we're over in these places, you know, it was just, you know, you worked your normal work day and then during your time off you had liberty, you could go out in town, you could um, go see some sights, you know, you could pretty much do whatever you wanted within reason um you couldn't travel too far away obviously because they wanted to keep tabs on you so you know they had a log book that we had to log in and out of and and whatnot but yeah when uh most of what i did when i was in australia was drink just go out in town and and um you know ate out at a lot of the local restaurants you know, I, I ate crocodile out there i had um had kangaroo um, which was tasted just like steak, extremely well done. I don't like my steak well done, so I'm more of a rare, medium rare kind of guy. So 
I wasn't crazy about the kangaroo, but I mean, other, other than that, it was good. Um, alligator, crocodile, it tastes just like chicken. <laughs> chicken from the sea. I, I don't know how else to describe it, but if you combine chicken with fish, it's got that, that type of a flavor. Um, you know. So you got to experience a lot of different things. Yeah, when I was in when I was in Japan, I actually a buddy and I we took a day trip. We went to Hiroshima, so I went to the to the Peace Park. I got to see where um, you know where where they dropped the first A bomb, and they had a big museum um, dedicated to that, just full of artifacts and uh, and pictures, and that that was a really sobering experience. And they they actually had the building which they say the bomb detonated above the only building or one of the only buildings left standing after the uh, the bomb went off and I they say it's because the bomb detonated directly above it so the blast kind of missed it so um, I got to see that building um, and as well as walk around the city of Hiroshima which was Japan was just uh, an amazing place I would highly recommend going there to anybody that has any interest in going um, it was a beautiful country, beautiful scenery. Um, the culture was, it was really neat to experience. Um, everybody there was so polite, even though, you know, you could tell for the most part, they weren't crazy about us, but they were very, very polite. They'd go out of their way to, to make you feel comfortable. Hospitality, unlike anything I've ever experienced here in the United States. Um, but it was, it was just, uh, Japan was beautiful. There's a lot of fun stuff to do out there. You know, I mean, like I said, it was just a totally different culture. And Australia was a lot of fun in the same regards because, again, totally different culture. But the, the thing with Australia was you didn't have a language barrier that you had to overcome. So you could interact with the locals. You could, you could converse with them, understand what was going on. You could watch TV and, and completely follow the conversations and whatnot. So... But it was still a totally different culture from uh, from the United States. As the president of the VAO on a university campus, what would be the one thing you would want other non-military students to know about veterans? Um, just understand that we, when we were serving, and some. Some vets are here on this campus, and I'm sure other campuses across the country are currently still serving, whether in the reserves or the guard or whatnot. But we're we're people just like uh, everybody else. Um, you know, we we're not necessarily people that are, you know, yearning for war all the time. Um, you know, we just we're normal guys working a job and, and, and like everybody else, doing what you have to do to get by. And, uh, you know, I think just understanding that, um, be a stepping stone and can go a long way. Is there anything else, Joe, that you'd like to include in this interview that I haven't included? Well, nothing that I can think of off the top of my head you at would this like point to in time. Turn the camera off. Probably. <laughs> we could turn it back on at that point. <laughs> Well, Joe, I'd like to thank you for your service, and I'd like to thank you for sharing your story. Thank you.